example too. It's not an easy job, folks. So, and we didn't buckle under this. There was a pressure. This thing has to get out today. And here it is. This is Glendora versus Nasty Natalia. This is the entire file. And it was this plus this, but I got it down to this. And this is the record on appeal, the docket, uh, the noticing the uh, appeal court uh, that the appeal is ready to be argued. And then something that's a very big surprise. Now this has taken nine hours so far. And I thought we'd have to buckle and give up wrapping the tapes to do this. But we did it. We persevered wrapping the tapes, alternating wrapping ten tapes at a time with working an hour on this Herculean United States of America, Glendora versus Nasty Natalia, brat sister Lydia, mother Marie, father, brother Carlos, preferred country properties, James Kleinbaum, George Dixon, Joanne Dixon, the village of Chatham, New York, and the Chatham Police Department. So this has to get out today. This is a Monday morning job. See, all during the week. I put down the date, and if it's postage, or if it's printing, or if it's one time only, if it's technical equipment, Postage, office supplies, postage, gasoline, technical equipment, office supplies, donations receipted, donations unreceived. And you put down the amount over here. And at the end of the week, on Monday, you add up the total. And you add it to last week's total, which is up here, carried totals forward. And you get the total so far this month for business. And you get the total in. And over here is personal. Groceries, household. And here are the totals over here. This is the in page. These are out pages business. Now we've got to take these totals, for instance, postage. 385 and put it in the postage column. You hold the camera, okay? Well, I write it in the postage column. Postage. 385. Okay? 385. And then here's all the other columns. Print and technical and so forth. Over here on this page is all personal. So that's how you go from daily to week and week to month. Well, folks, we got to the post office before it co uh, closed and we mailed the 41 videotapes. So they're on their way on schedule. Uh, we didn't make this, but we took the uh, the big one that goes to Nichols, and that costs five dollars and a half about. And then each one of these is going to cost a dollar sixty. And we sent a forty dollar money order to Production Central to make a Sony DV cam dub for that crazy QPTV board, Queen's Public Television. And now we're going to staple these and label them and stuff them into these envelopes. We fed the birds and the animals about ten times and that always gives us joy. So I'll be reading it to you momentarily. This is the judge and it's the biggest one of all. It's noticing the appeal to be heard. 
It's the docket. That's 12 pages. It's the appellant's brief. Which I will read you. And it's the um, With the attachments that went with the notice of appeal, all these very good arguments that, that you know, uh, Kleinbaum and Italia never gave Dixon any jurisdiction over Glendora. That's and Dixon's conduct and the complaint against Nasty Natalia, Glendora's, 100 pages. And then Glendora versus Nasty Natalia in Small Claims Court. And then Glendora um, opening statement. And then her ad dominum. And then finally Glendora ends up suing Bully Dixon and his wife, the village of Chatham, Chatham Police Department, Nasty Natalia, Brat Sister Lydia, Marie Mother, Father, Brother Carlos, and Preferred Country Cop Properties in the United States District Court in Chicago, and that's 200 pages. Remember that? I worked on that two hours a day from April, all of April, I guess, and half of May, and finally it was. So this is Nichols, the appeals judge, ready to go, $5.30. That's more than it costs to appeal. It costs $5 to appeal. So take a good look at it, and bye-bye. Folks, it's quarter to nine, and the affirmation of service says that I have until midnight to serve this. And that's to the appeals judge. And this is to uh, uh, Natalia's lawyer. And this is to the village of Chatham and the police department. And to Tim Bakchian, Commission on Judicial Conduct. Primadora, Deputy Judge in charge of the administration of the courts outside of New York City. Lippman, the judge in charge of the administration of the courts. And he does the courts in New York City. And Ceresia, Administrative Judge, who should have straightened out George. Dixon, Judith K, and I do mean Judith K, Chief Judge of the State of New York, Clerk of the Court, Chatham Village Court, that's Mrs. George Dixon, and Preferred Country Properties, Nasty Natalia, Brat Sister Lydia, Mother Marie, Father, Brother Carlos, Preferred Country Properties. And now they will be served time that we serve the Center for Judicial Accountability incorporated this accumulation of papers and a similar package goes to George McDermott great American hero they are both great American heroes Elena Sassauer and George McDermott look at this this must be five pounds of joy look at the size of this tomato that my neighbor Jane Dean brought to me last night. And by the way, folks, she took me to the post office at 8.45. Look at that, out of her garden. She and John, aren't they wonderful gardeners? And a nice piece of blueberry cake. And a banana. Why are these people so good to their neighbor? And cucumbers. 
he made beautiful pick, uh, pickles. Delectable. Great. And wax beans and green beans. No, these are all wax beans. Together, together, you are the Lord's blessing. You know what hymn really goes with this? What is it? How is it? Uh, come, you thankful people, come. Raise the song of harvest home. All is safely gathered in, ere the winter storm begins. God our Maker doth provide, for our wants to be supplied. Come to his own temple, come, raise the song of harvest home. I want to tell you that last night, Jane Dean, drove me in the dark to the post office for Glendora to serve the appellant's brief on preferred property, preferred country properties versus Glendora. One of the wickedest uh, landlords, frauds, and attempts to deceive. Well, it must be. It was wicked enough from here. It took 20 hours to do that paper, and it cost $78 to print and post it. And now I've got to set up the videotape and videotape it for you. And this is this beautiful August morning, so we go outdoors and video. Uh, first off, folks, I have to get a picture for you of this blue sky. It's not as perfect. It's not perfect the way it was uh, Sunday. There is a haze. And yesterday, there was a haze a little bit, but it's a lot better than what we've had most of this summer. And too bad this was the first thing scheduled this morning after the morning work, because the ground is mucho wet, and you can feel September coming, because the dew doesn't get off the grass as fast as it did in June and July. Okay, I think we're ready. This poor little ant has problems with the... Can you see the ant? You see the ant? You think the ant will make it? And you think you dry out? You think you make it? All right. This was uh, started to write this on August 21st, finished it yesterday, August 23rd. Uh, as I told you, it was served at uh, 9 p.m. in the black dark uh, last night. Supreme Court County of Columbia, State of New York, United States of America. And it's to be argued by Glendora. And it's preferred country crop properties. Uh, is the uh, plaintiff Appley, and Glendor is the uh, defendant appellant. And it was before George C. Dixon in the Chatham Village Court, and that's the index number. And this is the <coughs> appellant's brief. This is Glendor's brief. You get a good shadow of a picture of the camera, don't you? And this chair is wet. And uh, here is the docket. I made this docket. This is the job of the county, of the clerk, not the, of the village clerk, to keep a docket. But the uh, Chatham Village Court doesn't do anything right. So I made this docket, and that took innumerable hours. And I don't know whether I should e read this to you or not, this docket. It all started uh, way back in November of 2003 when the furnace went off. Well, it really started in August when it took uh, Nasty Natalia nine days 
uh, to fix the uh, kitchen sink faucet, put a washer in it, that took nine days. And so, uh, and also she didn't clean up the property, and I had to pay people to clean up the property. But I was right, it was easier to pay people to do it than it was to get her to do it. And uh, in November when the furnace stopped, and it was 35 degrees, uh, I didn't want to wait nine days for it to get fixed, and I called her place, and it was a recorder, and I wanted it done, because I was really getting sick. It was close to hypothermia, and I asked my people at church what I should do, and the father of one of them is a furnace man, and he came and he fixed it, and it was nice, and we were all warm again. Thank you, church. And the bill was $183, and as soon as it came, I paid it. And then I asked Natalia to pay it, but she didn't pay it. So I took it out of the rent, which you're supposed to do. And then when it came time to uh, fix the kitchen sink again, this is the drain, the water was just pouring out of it, and it would have ruined the place. And I didn't want to wait nine days for an Italian to fix that. So I asked my neighbor to fix it, and he did a great job, and he got the parts, and he only got $10 for his labor. And that was $26, and so I sent the bill. I paid that, of course, immediately, and I sent the bill to Natalia, and she never paid it, so I deducted that from the rent. And then the t this was an apartment, and Natalia never told me in the beginning that she expected the tenant to pay for the water. You don't pay for water in an apartment, do you, folks? And uh, so these water bills kept coming, and they mounted to about $30 a quarter. And there were about three of them, so it's about $120. And so Natalia was being nasty all along. It was too bad. Uh, and on the day after St. Patrick's Day, a man came in a white truck. And I was sitting on the sun porch, and it looked ominous to me, so I went into the house, and I locked both of the doors, and I watched the man from the windows, and surely enough, he was serving a paper. And he looked like a cop, because he had a crew cut. You know how cops think it's so nice to be military and have a crew cut. And he gave himself away, and I watched him, he never saw me. And it did turn out to be a petition for a three-day eviction. You know, that's insane. For non-payment of rent. It was a fraud. It was a lie. The rent was paid. And to make it a three-day eviction, you know, that's just uh, sadism. So the court date on it was for March the 23rd, within three, four, five, six days. And, uh... I looked at the petition, and I could see its defects right away. It had no index number, and it was all wrong. The rent was paid. There was no rent owing. Uh, and it was all a hoax and a fraud and a frame-up. And uh, that was Thursday the 18th, and on Friday I gathered up the mud off of my shoes every time I went into the house and out of the house my shoes were caked in mud and it took me you know half an hour to wash them and then it took them a day to dry and I guess had to, uh, I had to buy extra footwear and so some of this caked mud I took it and I scraped it off of the, of the shoes and I put it on a piece of white paper in a box top and I took it up on Friday the 19th of March and I went into Natalia's office and I put the cake of mud on her desk because I had asked for a remedy before for this mud. There's no need of that. You can put down stones 
or flagstones. You can put down things. The whole driveway and the whole entrance to both doors doesn't have to be mud. You know, it was just uh, negligence and poor uh, ownership. <coughs> Excuse me. So uh, <laughs> I put it on a desk. She was behind her desk. And in a, an outrageous temper fit, she shoved the box cover toward me. And I jumped, I jumped back. And uh, the mud went all over her carpet. And then she called the police. Now that's false alarm. So you see, nasty Natalia is building up a terrible case for herself. So Friday, after that, I had to go to Hudson, and uh, I bought newspapers. And uh, when I came back Friday at 3 p.m., I sat down with this petition, and I refuted every paragraph of it. Practically every phrase of it was defective. It was fatally defective. There was no way that this petition could stand. It had no index number. No way it could stand up in court. So I went after it and I wrote for about three or four hours on it. And then I started my complaint. Glendora versus Nasty Natalia. Uh, Brat sister Lydia. Uh, Mother Marie, father, brother Carlos, and preferred country properties. This is in Chatham, New York, County of Columbia. The next day was Saturday, and early in the morning, I refused, continued to refute the petition until it was done, and then I wrote out the other things that Natalia had done over the uh, six or seven month period that were against the New York State real property law and of course the uh, the petition was against the New York State real property actions and proceedings law no in person service and no regular mail service and it's supposed to be nail and mail. And this cop, his name turned out to be McDowell, Michael McDowell, the cop, did not nail and mail. He just pushed it into the doorknob. And then I started to write that complaint. And it, pretty much all day Saturday and Sunday morning before church, I wrote on it an hour. And then after church, I came home, and by 3 o'clock Sunday afternoon, I'd really finished the complaint. And it was 100 pages. And I wrote the summons uh, to affix to the complaint, or to affix the complaint to the summons. And uh, later that evening, I started calling the rentals. I had every newspaper that was available all around. Register Star and the Independent and all of them. And I called all of the rentals and I talked to some people, and but anyway, I talked to one man and he found it nice, and so we made an appointment at 5 30 Monday. This would be Monday the 22nd, day before court. And it took all day Monday to write, uh, to rather print that complaint, about 10 copies, uh, 100 pages. It just took all day to print it. And during that time, Nasty Natalia banged on the window and put up a notice that she was going to have an expense inspection on Wednesday at such and such a thing. That she and a technician, and it's this technician was named Ed, and he's a handyman, and it was Ed who put the uh, kitchen sink faucet, when he put the faucets back together, he put them on backwards. So instead of going clockwise, they were going counterclockwise, and the other one was going the other way. And that's a test that they give you in psychology, right? You're used to doing, they give you tests and have you do left to right for 10 times, and then they reverse it and see if you can do it right to left to see what your adaptability is. It's just crazy these tests they have in psychology. As a psychology major, I 
became quite disenchanted with the whole thing and never pursued psychology, except for Smith College, where I was offered a uh, student teacher grad in, the grad in the school. I was a graduate, and so they offered me this student teacher position. But I never took it. I was in California. I didn't have the money to come back to Northampton, Massachusetts to take it. But Smith College is a very prestigious girls' college, women's college, Ivy League. Uh, so, this notice on the window, and then she slammed the window and disappeared, and I was busy printing, and I had signs up at the door that said, do not enter. Possession is under the name, is under the... Uh, possession is by the tenant. I'm telling you all this in case you run into a landlord like this, and there are millions of them like this. And I hope that this will show you how you can protect yourself. You don't have to take this. Well, it wasn't until after 5 o'clock that I finished printing uh, the complaint and summons and it was too late to serve it on anybody. And so I got to the new place at 5.30, and I liked it. And I gave the man $100 to keep it. And the rent was only 315 And the uh, electric and the heat and the stove were all uh, by an electric company. You didn't have to bother with kerosene and propane and all those things. Let me insert that one of the uh, most fraudulent things uh, Natalia did was that she never told us we had to pay the heat. Had she told us, we would have said, well, thank you, it's a nice place, but we don't want to pay the heat, and for 50 years we've never paid heat. Heat and hot water have always been paid by the landlord. Franklin and I refused to own a house because it's such a headache, and so we always rent it and let the landlord do all those things. But it always included the heat and hot water. And had she told us that, honestly, the way a realtor should, anybody a member of the National Association of Realtors should know better. Uh, and so she made us pay the heat, and it was $500 a year that we paid. And uh, when the furnace broke down that day, I asked Chatham Fuel to come and fix it, and they said, well, we'll charge $100 $20 just to come out there. It was a Saturday. We'll call it, charge you $120 just to come out there. And she made us take Chatham fuel when we could have found the propane and the kerosene uh, more cheaply elsewhere. So the whole thing was a fraud. And uh, so I was telling you about the new place. Uh, it was all electric. And it was all through the electric company, which made things much cleaner and much nicer. Next day was Tuesday, and uh, a friend uh, served Natalia the summons and complaint. Uh, Lydia locked the door and through the glass door and the glass windows, you could see Lydia very carefully. She locked it, and so my friend served her by putting it at the uh, right at the stoop. So she was served, and Pine Bomb uh, didn't have to be served because this was a new action. This was not a counterclaim. Now, this was a new lawsuit, and Klein Bomb had not appeared as a lawyer on this lawsuit, so he didn't have to be served. And I went over to the court and tried to serve it there. But there's no court. They're gone all week. The only time they're there is Tuesday night. So it came uh, Tuesday night, the hearing, and I have an audio tape of this, and I really should play it for you. I don't know. Let me consider, folks. Should I stop videotaping now and go research that audio tape and play it for you? I think that really is a sensible thing to do. All right. Let me tell you a couple of jokes, and I'll go do that. Uh, Bob says he doesn't know 
how old the used car is that he bought, but the odometer is in Roman numerals. Uh, Marilyn calls her car flattery because it never gets her anywhere. And Ed and Priscilla had a car that broke down so often, they bought themselves the perfect second car, a tow truck. And why does Joanne baby her car? How does she baby her car? Well, it won't go anywhere without a rattle. Uh, a boy was asked to describe the game of chess and he said chess is a game where two people sit opposite each other and stare at each other and never say anything and barely move and I liken that to the United States District Courts and Ed said that he was so ugly as a kid that his parents hired another kid to play his part in the home movie. And when Halloween came, he didn't, they didn't put a pumpkin in the window. They just made him stand in the window. And when he said that he's going to run away from home, his father said, put it in writing. And when he played hide and seek, the other children wouldn't come and look for him. And the man was in the maternity ward, and the nurse comes out with a beautiful baby in her arms, and she says to the new father, well, what'd you want, a boy or a girl? And he said, I wanted a girl. The nurse says, sorry, this is a boy. And the father says, oh, that's okay. That's my second choice. Okay, let me go find that tape and uh, play it for you. This would be March the 23rd, Tuesday night, circa 7 p.m before George C. Dixon, Justice, Chatham Village Court, County of Columbia, State of New York, United States of America. And you will hear Dixon, you will hear Glendora, you will hear uh, Natalia was there but didn't say anything, and you will hear Kleinbaum, James Kleinbaum. Woohoo! My seat's wet. Morning dew in August doesn't leave very fast. Well, I looked in the uh, contents cards on the index, and I found it, and it's audio tape uh, 21-41, and here it is, and then I started to play it, and right away it jammed. So I took the tape out and tried to get rid of the jam, and then I discovered that the tape is twisted. And when the tape twists, that means it plays it backwards. So I thought I would splice it and try to get the twist out, and then I thought I'd try to put another twist in it and get it to play frontwards. And it did. I could hear uh, conversations, and they were correct. And then it's going along, and then it jams inside. See, first of all, it jammed along this track. I got off track here. But look inside. You see inside there? That tape is supposed to go around this post up here. How do we know? Because you look at the good side, and you see the tape is going around the post up there. And then you have the problem that there's a double loop. double loop. I don't think that I can fix this. If it would travel, if it would go onto the take-up reel here, I could splice it maybe and get out stuff that we don't want, although it's too bad to ruin a record of other things. So, we 
Now this has been a Sony program. I don't think Sony really makes tapes that well. Or well, maybe nobody does. But you often have this problem of jamming and twisting and no take up. So what are we going to do about this? I can tell you what happened. I think that's what we'll have to do, because I've worked on this since I kept a record of it right here. Here's the record. I started working on it at what, 9.15? And there was a 9.15 joy and the 9.30 joy, and we just missed the 9.45 joy. But that would be an hour. A thing like this can take all day. I know Pat Galino might have a good chance at fixing it. But you see, a micro cassette, you can't take it apart. It doesn't have screws. It's all melted plastic. If it was a VHS, you could take it apart and you could re-thread it. But I don't think you can re-thread this one from the outside. I'm surprised it will even play, being off track as it is all along here. Okay, so I'll tell you what happened. Let me put this mess away and I'll tell you what. So I got the tape back onto the uh, right side of the front side. This is the front side. And the tape is back onto the spool. So I have to put it away. And wait for an inspiration on that. You see that tape is not twisted. Is it, or can't you tell? Uh, so there's really nothing I can do about it. But... I'll get an inspiration, maybe, that has happened before. And, uh... See if we possibly could fix it. Or think of a way. You got a cute little animal out here. I have to show you my stomach first, but see if I can get the animal up there. What kind of an animal is that? Cute, huh? I saw that animal once before. All right. So back to Natalia. Uh, the uh, hearing that night, the principal thing that came out of it is that I made the point that uh, Natalia and Kleinbaum had not given uh, this court jurisdiction over Glendora. First uh, one to the New York State Real Property Actions and Proceedings Law. Because you have to have personal service, and these uh, the law has to be strictly construed, particularly that law. That's the reason they made that law. They had the real property law, but it wasn't clear enough as to exactly what the actions and the proceedings should be. And so, uh, and with a quoting of all that law, Nixon's, uh, Dixon's head was spinning, and, uh, 
and Kleinbaum was doing his usual whining and saying, oh, well, we have a signed affidavit here by uh, Michael McDowell that he served it. And uh, I said, if there's going to be any uh, dispute as to uh, jurisdiction, I said, I want a Travis hearing. And a Travis hearing is where the server comes forth and you question the uh, Travis, uh, you question the uh, server, and you can pretty much make up your mind if he's telling the truth or not, or if he actually did serve it. So there was no way, you know, that he could claim that he had personal service. But particularly, I wanted you to hear that tape so that you could hear the acrimony of uh, George C. Dixon and his total ineptitude to, uh, to conduct a court hearing. You can see what was going on. They're trumping up a whole lot of charges, and they're all going to split it. Now, this is information and belief, my personal information and belief, and he's going by hook or by crook. He's going to get this money. Uh, so it was all very clear on the audio tape, and I'm sorry, <laughs> but God must have a plan. It's really clear when you have something like 2,000 audio tapes and the one that you want to play. Uh, goes bad on you. So uh, we're talking about Tuesday the 23rd. And then on Wednesday the 24th, a friend was helping me uh, move heavy stuff and, uh, and donating, offering his truck. And uh, it was very, very nice of him. And Natalia appears on the property with a stranger uh, whom she doesn't identify and she gets in the way, you know, while we're trying to load the truck and uh, she's making all kinds of uh, ad hominem remarks and um, actually picking up a piece of my property in my gasoline jug and putting it somewhere else, my property. On the, on the property over which I have the premise, the uh, possession of the premises. And so making uh, a fool of herself and a nuisance of herself. And I should have stopped right then and there and called the police and got her for trespassing. But I wanted to get these things moved. This was the only day and the only hour that my friend could have his truck available. And I wanted to get this important job done. So I just let her go, and I didn't say anything, and I videotaped her. And she took pictures of me, by the way, when I didn't want to be, have pictures taken on me. And uh, that was an invasion of privacy. It was all kinds of things. A mad, mad woman. Mad woman. Next day, Thursday. Uh, by the way, she came down and banged on the window again, took down one sign and put up another sign and said the inspection would be on Thursday. So uh, next day, Thursday, I waited around all morning for this inspection. The hours were given as from 9 to 2, uh, 9 to 12, and I had the video camera all set up, and I had the, uh, mic the audio tapes all rolling, two of them, I think. It was a good thing as compared to what happened today. And uh, just about, I thought it, she wasn't going to make it, and about five minutes to noon, she comes in with a so-called technician. I'd put up all kinds of barricades, uh, brooms, and uh, a rolling desk, and litter pans, and all kinds of things to stop her at the first door. But uh, she moved all of those and came into the inner door, and she rapped on the door, and the minute she did, I called the Chatham police. And I said uh, that who I was and what the address was, and that uh, I was a tenant and the landlord was here and under the laws, and I stated the laws, uh, that a, a landlord can inspect or come into the premises only in an extreme emergency. Well, this was no extreme emergency. And the minute she heard me call the police, she galloped away like a gazelle. She was gone in no time. She got into her truck and backed out, and Ed got into his truck and backed out. Now why? Why? She knew fully well that she was doing something illegal. And that was the last time, thank heaven, that she bothered me. 
And Thursday afternoon, I sent the security deposit and the first month's rents to the nice new man and secured that place. And I did it by money order, postal money order, so you wouldn't have to worry about whether the check was good or anything. So I made things nice for him. And uh, then I think Thursday, somebody else helped me with uh, moving some things. All my neighbors were very, very nice. And somebody else helped me with moving some things. And uh, Friday, I guess it was just more moving. And Saturday was more moving. And the kitty cats, I was taking care of the four kitty cats. And uh, it was sad because I knew this was going to be my last. I didn't know which would be the last day, but I said it could be today, that my last day with them. It was very, very sad. And they were also happy with me. And uh, Saturday was more moving. And Sunday, I went to church, and for the first time I was, I was late for church a little bit. But I had made two trips, well, one to the new place, take things to the new place, and two to take things to the old place, and to position them. And uh, then to church, and right after church, the kids helped me, and uh, did another load, then another load. It was all a sequence of load. Well, it's a sequence of this. You pack, you load, you drive, you unload, and you position. And you come back again and do it. Some more. And finally, by Sunday night, everything was cleared out, and the 1980 Lincoln was in a good, safe place off of the property. And uh, Sunday night, it vacated. Well, the first chance I had, I sat down Monday morning, and I wrote my opening statement. Uh, for the court for the uh, 30th of March, a week <coughs> from the initial court appearance. I wrote out this opening statement, and I served it on everybody. And you couldn't find anybody around the court there, so I left it in the chair of the so-called bench table. And so that was done, and I had to eat out because... Uh, and I don't like to eat out, and uh, because uh, Natalia had fouled up my ability to get a meal at home. And Tuesday, uh, I prepared for court, and Tuesday night I went to court, and I tried all day to file my opening statement and to file uh, the proof of service of my, oh, there was another lawsuit, darn, I forgot about that. I didn't tell you that then on March the 23rd, the night of the first hearing, that I filed a new lawsuit. And it was Glendora versus Nasty Natalia, brat sister Lydia, mother Marie, father, brother Carlos, and preferred country properties. And Joanne Dixon was the clerk, and she didn't want to make it out as Nasty Natalia. Uh, and she asked me to put things, uh, typewrite things, or get somebody to typewrite them for me. And anyway, she made out the summons and the uh, little paper that they had. There's two little papers. And that was Thursday that I had a neighbor uh, serve that and gave the neighbor boy $20 to do it. And Natalia was served personally. She asked the neighbor boy to come in. So uh, the service on that was perfect. And I tried to the second court appearance, which is March the 30th, Tuesday night, a week later, I wanted to file the uh, affidavit of service for that, to show that it was ready to be argued. And I wanted to file my opening statement and get them date stamped. And I asked six times. I came to court uh, around 6 o'clock, and I waited, and I asked, and I asked the policeman, and I asked Dixon, uh, so-called justice, to see the clerk so I could get these date stamps, and he blocked me six times. So finally when the clerk did come out, uh, when uh, the case was up there, all of my attention went to Joanne Dixon and getting these two papers date stamped. And while I'm attending to this, ex parte, Kleinbaum is saying to Dixon 
that she vacated and you better get a uh, a statement from her that she did vacate. That was on Sunday, the 28th, I vacated. And Dixon said, did you vacate? And I'm busy thinking about these things and getting the, getting them date stamped. And I said, did I vacate? And he goes like this and shakes his head and goes into the histrionics. And I said, yes. And I didn't even have time to think whether I wanted to answer Dixon or not. Whether it was uh, in my favor to say whether I vacated or not. But right then and there, that should have ended everything. I vacated. The action was over. And then, Sleazy, Schlein, uh, Kleinbaum, says to Dixon, uh, we want to adjourn until April 13th, which was the date of my new lawsuit against Natalia. We want to adjourn until that date because we have damages. Well, the thing about damages is that no complaint had ever been filed about damages. This was a new complaint, and they never filed it. So that was all uh, illegal. And so I never had a chance to say whether I wanted an adjournment or not. And I never had a chance to say uh, the damages would be a new complaint and they can't ride in on this old one, that this case was over. It was uh, for a three-day eviction and I uh, voluntarily left. I didn't give her a chance to do the eviction. I left voluntarily and happily. I didn't want anything more to do with Natalia and preferred country properties. And if you go to Chatham, I would advise you not to have anything to do with preferred country properties. Well, you won't, I don't think, after you hear this story. This, uh, uh, rather I should say, this report. Well, I think the next day, the 31st, I sat down and I devoted two hours a day to writing a motion that George Dixon recoups. And I spent two hours a day on that, up until April the 13th, which was when I summoned uh, Natalia to court on Glendora versus Nasty Natalia. And so on that, that's the court proceeding of April the 13th. I do have an audio tape, too, of the court proceeding on March the 30th, but that is not, it doesn't tell much. And what I've told you is about all that happened. I, there were quite a few denials of my due process, and I've told you those. So now, let me see if I can find the audio tape. I know, I think I can find it all right. These are the little index cards that list the contents of each tape. And let's see if I can cue it up, and let's see if the tape is all right and not jammed. Okay, this is Glendora, chat with Glendora on 45 TV stations and on the internet at uh, www.achatwithglendora.com. And I am telling the story of an extremely uh, deceitful landlord named Natalia and her company preferred country properties, and also I'm telling the story of her liar for hire, uh, James Kleinbaum, and I'm telling the story of uh, James Dix, uh, George Dixon, village justice of the uh, justice court of the Chatham village, and of his wife who was the clerk at that court. Okay, so let's see if we can, as Warner Von Braun, as Warner Wolf used to say, not Von Braun. Let's go to the videotape. Now again, this is on the night of April the 13th. I'm waiting, waiting, waiting. And I go up to Dixon. I kept asking, you know, to file my papers. I wanted to get them date stamped, and I kept being blocked. And then I had some questions that I wanted to ask, procedural questions. Well, finally I went up to Dixon, who was sitting at his table, and I said, can I ask a question?
I said, may I ask the clerk a question? And Dixon said, she's busy right now. So I asked him, I said, should this be filled in? This was on my summons uh, of uh, Natalia and the service of it. And I said, should that be filled in? He said, no. And I asked him if something else should be filled in. And he said no. to Dixon again. He was sitting at the table, which he calls the bench. And I asked, may I see the file jacket? And he says, what? I said, the file jacket. And he wanted to know what that was. And I said, as to the case. And he said, no. So let me tell you that. So let me find out what next happened while I'm waiting for this case to go on. So I got there at, I was told to be there at 6.30, I got there at 6. And I'm sitting there and waiting, and it's 6.25, my recorder's telling me it's 6.20, 6.25. And there's those two things I told you about. And then Kleinbaum goes by, who was Natalia's lawyer, and I said, See if I find anything else that's recorded on this. So a police officer goes by, and it happens to be McDowell, and I said I wanted to go see the clerk of the court because I wanted these things date, uh, date stamped. And he says, you can wait and do it later. I listened to the uh, whole tape down to uh, the point where the hearing started, and with George Dixon Court, uh, nobody says, uh, you know, uh, preferred properties versus Glendora, nobody calls the case. You just watch, and when you see Kleinbaum and Natalia sit down at the table, then you go up to the table. That's wrong. The cases should be called. Likewise, they're never adjourned. The people just drift off. Okay, I found it. And so now I'm going to play it for you. Now I'll keep the close-up uh, onto the uh, tape recorder. And the actors are uh, Chatham Village Court on April the 13th, 04. Uh, George C. Dixon, Justice. Uh, Mrs. George C. Dixon, the uh, clerk. Uh, Natalia, Landlord. And Glendora, Tenant. And James Kleinbaum, Lawyer.
Pine Bog translated as Little Tree. Okay, folks, here it is.